Today we take a brief look at the Gospel of John to see what the Spirit has to say to the church. In this passage, Jesus says, And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. According to John, among those who came to worship at the feast of the Passover were some Greeks. Some Greeks is his only designation for these people. He does not give us their names or any other information about them. He simply says, now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They approached Philip, apparently aware that he was a disciple of Jesus, and presented him with this one request. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. John says that Philip went and told Andrew, and then both Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Here, two things catch my attention. First, they were able to determine that Philip was a follower of Jesus. There was something about Philip that gave him away. Perhaps it was his physical proximity to Jesus. Perhaps it was the way he spoke. Perhaps it was his body language. Perhaps it was the way he interacted with Jesus. Whatever it was, these Greeks decided that he was not just a bystander, an outsider, but an insider with power to give them access to Jesus. I often wonder if there are things about 21st century disciples that make us stand out. When meeting us, do people detect that we are a part of our Lord's inner circle? If so, why? If not, why not? I submit to you, that if we do not have that certain something that gives us a way, that light about us that indicates we are followers of Jesus, we must take the time to rethink our relationship with Christ and pray for the power to make people believe that we can help them gain access to Jesus. I have just returned from an evangelism conference in Cleveland, Ohio. It was cold in Cleveland. It was so cold, I couldn't wait to get back home. But anyway, I heard there many different voices on many different topics, but the one thing they all had in common was our need to help people gain access to Jesus. You are here today because somebody evangelized you. Somebody helped you gain access to Jesus. We must be the people who help others gain access to Jesus. The next thing that catches my attention is this. These Greeks said, sir, we wish to see Jesus. This simple request, I think, is the deep cry of humanity. We want to see Jesus. The great spiritual masters have always believed and taught that our great hunger is for God and for God alone. We want to see the face of Christ. We want to know him as we are known. We want 
to walk with him and talk with him. We want to feel the hand of God molding us and making us after his will. We want to connect with the great I am, the holy other, the eternal creator spirit, the one who was and is and is to come. Our deep hunger is for the living bread. Because we are who we are, because we are created in the image of God, we will not be satisfied until we see Jesus. We will not be satisfied until we touch the face of God. Now, it is interesting that Jesus does not grant the request of these Greeks, these Greek travelers. He does not say no, but neither does he say yes. Instead, he turns to his disciples and he shares four thoughts which will change their lives forever. First, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Here, Jesus attempts to teach us that spiritual gain comes when we die to a higher cause, one greater than ourselves. There is no other way. Now, this does not mean that life is all work and no play, all sacrifice and no fun. No, not at all. In spite of the challenges that come our way, life was essentially created for our enjoyment. When we deny ourselves the life that we have imagined in favor of the life God has dreamed for us, that is when and where we find our highest joy and our greatest pleasure. We must make the words of the hymn writer our words and our prayer. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after your will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only, always living in me. This dying to self is not for the sake of dying alone, no. That would be much too morbid for anyone to swallow. But it is so that we might find the highest life and live into the greatest good. Through our death to purely selfish aims and selfish ambitions, we give birth to the fruit of the Spirit. St. Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This fruit of the Spirit will continue to transform our parish into a place of rest for weary travelers. This fruit of the Spirit will continue to transform our diocese into an instrument of compassion and light. This fruit of the Spirit will transform our nation into a place where the oppressed will find the liberty enshrined in our constitutional promises. This fruit of the Spirit is what will transform the world into the beloved community. This beloved community now does not have to be just a dream. It can become a reality in this community, the beloved community. The poor will be blessed with compassionate companions. The weak will be joined by powerful defenders. The helpless will come to know that God is with 
them just as he has promised. By giving birth to the fruit of the Spirit, we will make the heretofore impossible possible and the unthinkable our very way of life. Second, Jesus says, those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. These words are words hard to hear for the modern ear. They sound extreme, too extreme to be worthy of our attention. And so we ask ourselves, can we not love our lives and save them as well? What benefit is it for us to hate the life we have? Well, I think this is what's happening in this text. Here, John is using a statement so extreme it was bound to catch the reader's attention. The main idea is this. The person who surrenders their life to God shall receive a better life in return. The text could therefore be read this way. Those who hold on to their way of doing things will lose the opportunity to find a better way. And those who surrender their way for the way of God will find a life that is more than we could ever ask or imagine. The person who surrenders their life to God will enter a better life. Each time we surrender to the will of God, each time we yield to the way of God, each time we submit to the word of God, our quality of life increases and our capacity to live in hope grows more and more and more in the light of God's favor. Third, Jesus says, whoever serves me must follow me and where I am there will my servant be also. To serve Christ is to follow him. To serve Christ is to be found where he is. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says that he came to serve the poor, the captives, the blind, the oppressed. We know by the testimony of the Bible and the traditions of the church that Christ is found among those who are hurting and among those in need. Christ is found among the homeless, the orphaned, and the hungry. Christ is found among the poor, the exploited, and the lonely. Christ is found among the oppressed and the dispossessed. Christ is found among those who have been blinded by the pain of life. Christ is found among those who, are, who have been held captive by their need to control their lives and the lives of others. Our Lord calls upon the church to leave the comfortable pulpit and the comfortable pew and to go with him into these places where the hurt of humanity is deep and strong wherever that might be. Our Lord calls upon the church to reach beyond our stained glass windows and to throw out the lifeline to those who are perishing. To serve Christ is to follow him. To serve Christ is to be found where he is. And lastly, Jesus says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. This is without question one of the great promises of the Bible. 
Here he means, here he says, if I am lifted up on the cross, I will draw all people to myself. The cross makes possible the redemption of humanity. The cross makes possible the compassionate construction of new communities of faith. The cross makes it possible for the joy of the Lord to become our strength. In all that we do, we must lift up the name of Jesus. We must lift him up in worship. We must lift him up in praise. We must lift him up in gratitude. Worship is the way that brings the wanderer back to God. Praise is the practice of putting God in the proper place in our lives. Gratitude is the gateway to a more gracious and grace-filled life. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw, I'll draw, I will draw all people to myself. For this and more, we give God the glory and we give God the praise. Let the church say, Amen.